This is the Weekly on ClickOrlando.com with Justin Warmith. Good morning, I'm Justin Warmith. After two scrubs, NASA is hoping the third time's the charm for its Artemis I moon mission. Over the last month, engineers have been working to address a hydrogen leak, and they did so during a fueling test last week. This morning, Ken Kramer with Space Up Close is here to explain the repairs NASA made and why this first test flight is critical for the future of space exploration. It's really important to fix these hydrogen seals. That's the, the main thing they had was leaks of hydrogen. And when it's above 4% concentration, that's above the flammability limit. That's when it can burn, and that's when you can have explosions and fires, and that is really bad for the rocket. This so is different, that was though, one right? of the issues. Well, the issue was in the same place, right. actually. They replaced this, these QD seals, quick disconnect seals, um, that is a, uh, there's a plate that goes from the ground side to the flight side of the rocket, and there's seals inside. They replace them four inch and eight inch. One is the fuel feed line, and one is a, a, an extra line for off gassing. They replace both of those. They found yesterday this, the leak was in the same place, actually. The other issue was the engine chill down. There was a sensor that gave them a faulty reading. One of the engines, number three, didn't seem to chill down right. That uh, was on the first uh, launch attempt. And um, it turns out that was faulty, but, and it was scrubbed, but they would have not launched anyway because the weather was actually red almost the whole time, so mm -hmm. it wouldn't have launched any time. The second time, it was all the hydrogen leaks. They were trying to figure it out, and uh, they couldn't. They heated and cooled the seal to try to get it to reseat. Did not work. That did work yesterday during the tanking test, but took many hours to get it right. done. Right, that's, that's what I was trying to make the point, is that this is, it was a completely different way of fueling this rocket right. than, than what they had previously done. A, a lot longer of a process. Yes. But is that something that is sustainable or something that they would do if they were preparing for launch? Well, this is the issue. This is why we don't know yeah. if they're going to be able to launch <laughs> uh, on the September 27th or yeah. not. They used a kinder and gentler approach, they talk about. That, yeah, that was the Loading quote. it a slower and 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 that way there's minimize the temperature and pressure spikes in those seals mm -hmm. okay so they did that and they found a leak right away actually when I was driving in for the test it already spiked up to seven percent which is twice the limit so we thought we were done for the day what they did though was they warmed it up and then cooled it back down and the seal miraculously seeded and that stopped the leak, unlike three weeks ago during the second launch attempt. So that worked out really good, but it did take longer. And they had to lower the pressure in the, in the tank, the feed tank, and that because it went up again to 3% right at the edge of the limit. Um, but they slowed it down some more, the, the pumping in of the hydrogen, and that got it down to about a half a percent concentration of hydrogen. So that was the safe limit. And then all took time. It took many more hours than expected, but it did succeed, mm -hmm. and they did fully fuel the rocket, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, both stages, the core stage and the upper stage, the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, the ICPS. So they loaded two fuels into four uh, storage fuel tanks in the rocket, upper stage, lower stage. It all went very well, but it took quite a few more hours. Mm -hmm. So now they have to review all of that data Okay, and that is what they're doing right now, and that's why we really don't know when they're gonna go ahead with this launch. Uh, you were at the press site, you've been at the Kennedy Space Center uh, for the entire month, basically, as you've watched all this play right. out, and a number of issues. It, how is morale there? Is it, are, are, are people optimistic still that, that this rocket in the next week or so, or maybe even in this calendar year, is there optimism that they will get it off the ground? I think there's a lot of optimism. I think the morale is high. These, mm -hmm. ex these problems are to be expected. This is why they did wet dress rehearsals. I wish they had done a fifth wet dress rehearsal exactly for these reasons. Mm -hmm. They stopped at number four, but they still had issues. I wish they had done the fifth one. I think this points out the issues they're having that they should have done more practice before actually doing the launch attempt to ring out the, these problems and ring out these hydrogen issues and fuel loading issues. Um, so yeah, I think the morale is high. I think the public, yeah, their morale might be a little <laughs> lower. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. But 
you know what? This mission must succeed. The yeah. rocket must work. Orion must go to the moon and it must return. Whether it launches today, tomorrow, the next month, or the month of that, is, after that is completely irrelevant. It has to work. Mm-hmm. There's really no margin for failure. So a year from now, nobody's going to care right. what day we launch. So the morale will be high and it will stay high so mm-hmm. long as we have success. And so safety has to be paramount. Mm-hmm. That's why they did this extra cryogenic tanking test. I'm really glad they did that test. It was absolutely the right thing to do. They learned a lot. Now they're evaluating the data. So yeah, morale is high, but this is the rocket business. Yeah. And if you have a mistake, everybody's going to see that mistake. And so then the, that would call into question the future of the program. And that is what would cause morale to so plummet. That w- that's a good okay. point. Great point. Uh, the, the, you know, not doing a fifth wet tr- uh, dress rehearsal and, and try, you know, from the outside in, it maybe look like things are a bit rushed. But do you think that's the pressure that NASA feels to follow this timeline that's already behind schedule? There is some pressure to get it done, but yeah. they also know, as the administrator and the others have said, is that in the end, we have to be safe. Yeah. So, you know, I think they were hoping that uh, they, could, they could not delay it to a later launch window, and they had met many of the objectives after the fourth wet dress rehearsal. They did just about everything. They met all their primary objectives. The ones they didn't meet were, were, were less important, re- de- demonstrate that they could cut the, the countdown off at nine seconds, recycle it back, to, to 10 minutes and count back down to, to three minutes or so. So that wasn't demonstrated, but uh, everything else was demonstrated. So from their standpoint, and I can understand it, they, they felt it was, it was sufficient. From an outside observer standpoint, I am a scientist. I worked in chemical factories, so I know a little bit about how this goes. I worked with dangerous toxic chemicals for 30 years. So I, I can base my opinion on my own real life experience in chemical factories, not just some pundit who doesn't know anything, all right? <laughs> I, 30 years I worked in chemistry making pharmaceutical medicines to help save people's lives. Mm-hmm. So I know what's, what's at stake. I worked with million gallon reactors and if I turn a valve the wrong way, it's gonna blow up, kill me, maim me, or my coworkers and I don't want something like that to happen. So mm-hmm. that's what's in the back of my mind, mm-hmm. always safety. And that's what, what they're thinking. So they met their objectives. The shuttle took five or six times to do a successful wet rest rehearsal. And um, so, you know, in the end, it's, 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 a, it's a really close call. So this was like another wet dress. I'm really glad they did it. Things mm-hmm. worked out, but they're going to have to modify more procedures now and think about the countdown and how long it's really going to take because they only have 70 minutes on uh, September 27th. Mm-hmm. So with this longer loading procedure, they may not be able to fit all of that in in case they have delays. Coming up, Kramer will take us through the entire mission from liftoff to splashdown of the Orion capsule and what NASA is hoping to learn. Stay with us. This is the Weekly on ClickOrlando.com with Justin Warmith. Welcome back. The Artemis moon mission has no doubt faced challenges in the last decade. It's years behind schedule, billions over budget, and its last two launch attempts had to be scrubbed for technical issues. However, it seems like those problems have been fixed, and NASA is pressing ahead to launch the most powerful rocket ever built. Ken Kramer with Space Up Close is back with us now with insight on the mission. Uh, other than uh, taxpayer money being used uh, for why Americans should care about the Artemis One mission, aside from that, tell us about the future and, and the ultimate goal and why this first test flight is so critical. This test flight is critical because it sets up the whole Artemis program for the future. There's no astronauts on here. There are three mannequins to measure as though an astronaut was there, temperatures, pressures, radiation, Mm -hmm. all the sensations that the astronauts would feel. Um, And if this is successful, and it must be successful, then Artemis II will go ahead. Artemis II will have a crew of four astronauts, three NASA astronauts and a Canadian, the first non-American to go beyond the moon. So that will happen on Artemis II, Mm -hmm. and that can only happen if Artemis I is successful. So that's going to happen around two years from now, late 2024. So this mission sets that one up. And then after that, 
Even more exciting, we're going to land back on the moon for the first time in 50 years. Mm -hmm. Artemis III, the first woman and the first person of color. So super exciting. Mm -hmm. It's bringing the whole world in. NASA is very diverse, okay? And that is the whole goal. We want the whole country involved, mm -hmm. everybody to be motivated and inspired. And we're going to the South Pole. That's a difference too. Apollo went equatorial. South Pole, why is that important? I'm a chemist. Well, there's the water is there. We can live off the water if we mine those south polar craters. Mm. That water is there because comets struck there over the last billion years. Comets strike the Earth every day. They got organic molecules, water, and other things too. The south pole, we have permanently shadowed craters. There's no sun coming into the crater like we have here in front of us, okay? Right. And so they're permanently shadowed, so when those comets hit, the water doesn't evaporate. So that gives us what? gives us rocket fuel, hydrogen and oxygen we can split the water into. It also gives us water we can drink. It gives us oxygen we can breathe if we can mine that. So that's why we're going to the South Pole. Mm -hmm. So that will lead to a sustainable presence on the moon and maybe NASA will build a moon base. And it's also a proving ground. The moon is a proving ground to go to Mars. That's the ultimate goal in the late 2030s. We wanna send our astronauts mm -hmm. as, as humanity not just the United States, but as humanity going, going to Mars. Mm -hmm. So that is the whole goal. Artemis I sets that all up. That's why I say, and NASA says, this mission must be successful. If it's not, they'll have to repeat something and the whole schedule will get delayed. So safety is paramount. It must succeed. If the first domino doesn't fall, the rest do the not others fall. The others can't, exactly. Uh, all right, so this mission, though, this Artemis I mission, I, I, I want to... Briefly let our viewers know what they can expect. It's a 42-day um, rendezvous, if you will, before uh, the Orion capsule splashes back down right. uh, on Earth. Um, take us through that and, um, and what viewers should expect to see with this 42-day mission. Yeah, what, what this mission sets up on these, these launch dates now in uh, September 2nd or uh, September 27th, September, yeah. 27th mm -hmm. and October 2nd is the backup date, sets up a long class mission where Orion will have like a five, six, seven week mission around the moon. It will actually orbit the moon, okay, mm -hmm. one and a half times. And, and, and so that'll be stressing Orion beyond what it was designed to do. And that's really good because we want to put the astronauts in there. We want to stress beyond what it was capable of doing. We want to find out if there's a problem. Is there anything that needs to be changed in the Orion capsule? Uh, before? Because it's going to be hauling. Because it's going to be hauling. Right. And when it comes back, it's going to hit the Earth's atmosphere at 25,000 miles an hour. Mm. So the shuttle was 17,000 miles an hour, approximately. So much hotter. Mm -hmm. 5,000 degrees. The heat shield is bigger. This is 16 and a half feet. Uh, wide, biggest heat shield, even bigger than the Mars rover heat shields, which were about a foot smaller for Perseverance and for Curiosity on Mars. Anyway, so it's going to test that out. So, so the rocket will lift off, the solids will um, be jettisoned about two minutes into flight, about eight minutes into flight. They'll go into orbit. After two hours, they will release the Orion capsule and it will set up for a translunar injection. So that'll take a couple of days to get there. They'll fire the engines to go within 61 miles of the surface of the moon, okay? And then it'll make another loop around. It'll go 40,000 miles beyond the moon, farther than any human-rated spacecraft before. And it'll loop around again. And then they'll fire the engines to come back, come back to the Earth. And that will set up the uh, trans-Earth injection. And so that's after five, six, seven weeks. It di it's different depending on what day it launches. It's right. never exactly the same. Mm. It's all orbital mechanics that is defined when the universe was formed, all right? So it'll come back, it'll hit the Earth's atmosphere. That's the part when we'll start seeing things again. And so they'll recover it, hopefully in the Pacific Ocean, mm -hmm. and um, off uh, with Navy ships and bring it back here and analyze it. Another thing I could mention is that on the way out, there are 10 CubeSats, 10 science CubeSats that are really interesting. They will be deployed after the launch. They're on the, uh, the upper stage uh, adapter, and they were going to, some of them, look for the, uh, the water ice with, that we've been talking about. They're going to measure for water spectrometers. They're going to measure for, for hydrogen. 
a signal of water. Some are going to take some pictures of Orion actually uh, departing, and then there's others going to fly close to an asteroid. So there's 10 really exciting science missions. So they are not critical to the success of those missions. I'm interested in them as a scientist, and it will help also set up the future uh, missions, maybe help select landing sites. NASA has some proposals, but this will add to that information because we got to find a landing site where the ice is mm -hmm. and where it's safe to land. So that's what you can expect also those, those CubeSats. Mm -hmm. So this uh, SLS, I mean, bottom line is we saw so many people go out for the first two scrubbed attempts. A lot of folks want right. to witness this in person and right. feel it because yes. there's so much, um, a lot comparison, I guess you could say, to just the feel of, of what this will be and, and what the shuttle felt like. And, and so just for folks who might be thinking about going out to the Space Coast or watching this in person, mm -hmm. what, do you, what can you tell them about what they should expect to feel with this SLS rocket? You can expect a, a spectacular experience. I was there for the shuttle. Any of you who might have seen mm -hmm. the shuttle okay, we'll know that was stunning, is beyond anything. The, the most powerful rocket in the world at mm -hmm. that time. This is even more powerful, so it'll be <laughs> even louder, mm -hmm. it'll rumble more, it'll be brighter, it's got two solid rocket boosters, you will see them up, go to orbit in the sky, you'll see that exhaust trail, it'll be fantastic. That's a big advantage over SpaceX. SpaceX doesn't have solids, so you don't see it. You just see the flames. You're going to see a gigantic vapor trail, and that's what I'm really looking forward to. And you can count on News 6 and ClickOrlando.com to bring you complete coverage of this historic launch. You can read more about the Artemis program as well and the timeline for future missions with astronauts on board right now on ClickOrlando.com space. I'm Justin Mormoth. Have a great Sunday.